Stories from the Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. The Magic Monastery. A certain quiet dervish used often to attend the weekly meals given by a cultivated and generous man. The circle was known as the Assembly of the Cultured. The dervish never took part in the conversation, but simply arrived, smilingly shook hands with all present, seated himself in a corner, and ate the food provided. When the meeting was over, he would stand up, say a word of farewell and thanks, and go his way. Nobody knew anything about him, though when he first appeared, there were rumours that he was a saint. For a long time, the other guests thought that he must indeed be a man of sanctity and knowledge, and they looked forward to the time when he might impart some of his wisdom to them. Some of them even boasted of his attendance at their meetings to their friends, hinting at the special distinction which they felt at his presence. Gradually, however, because they could feel no relationship with this man developing, the guests began to suspect that he was an imitator, perhaps even a fraud. Several of them felt uncomfortable in his presence. He seemed to do nothing to harmonise himself with the atmosphere and did not even contribute a proverb to the enlightened conversation which they had come to prize as a necessary part of their very lives. A few, on the other hand, became unaware that he was there at all, since he drew no attention to himself. But one day the dervish spoke. He said, I invite all of you to visit my monastery tomorrow night. You shall eat with me. This unexpected invitation caused a change of opinions in the whole assembly. Some thought that the dervish, who was very poorly dressed, must be mad and surely could provide them with nothing. Others considered his past behaviour to have been a test. At last, they said to themselves, at last he would reward them for their patience and bearing with such dreary company. Still others said to one another, Beware, for he may well be trying to lure us into his power. But curiosity led them all including their host, to accept the hospitality. The following evening, the dervish led them from the house to a hidden monastery of such size and magnificence that they were dazed. The building was full of disciples carrying out every kind of exercise and task. The guests passed through contemplation halls filled with distinguished-looking sages who rose in respect and bowed at the dervish's approach. The feast which they were given surpassed all powers of description. The visitors were overwhelmed. All begged him to enroll them as disciples forthwith. But the dervish would only say to all their entreaties, Wait until morning. Morning came, and the guests, instead of waking in the luxurious silken beds to which they had been conducted the night before, clad in gorgeous robes, found themselves lying stiff and stark, dispersed on the ground within the stony confines of a huge and ugly ruin on a barren mountainside. There was no sign of the dervish, of the beautiful arabesques, the libraries, the fountains, the carpets. "'The infamous wretch! He's tricked us with the deceits of sorcery!' shouted the guests. They alternately condoled with and congratulated one another for their sufferings and for having at last seen through the villain, whose enchantments obviously wore off before he could achieve their evil purpose, whatever that might have been. Many of them attributed their escape to their own purity of mind. But what they did not know was that by the same means which he had used to conjure up the experience of the monastery, the dervish had made them believe that they were abandoned in a ruin. They were, in fact, in neither place. He now approached the company as if from nowhere and said, "'We shall return to the monastery.' He waved his hands, and all found themselves back in the palatial halls. Now they repented 
for they immediately convinced themselves that the ruins had been the test and that this monastery was the true reality. Some muttered, It is as well that he did not hear our criticisms. Even if he only teaches us this strange art, it will have been worth while. But the dervish waved his hands again, and they found themselves at the table of the communal meal, which they had, in fact, never left. The dervish was sitting in his customary corner, eating his spiced rice as usual, saying nothing at all. And then, watching him uneasily, all heard his voice speak, as if within their own breasts, though his lips did not move. He said, While your greed makes it impossible for you to tell self-deceit from reality, there is nothing real which a dervish can show you, only deceit. Those whose food is self-deceit and imagination can be fed only with deception and imagination. Everyone present on that occasion continued to frequent the table of the generous man, but the dervish never spoke to them again. And after some time, the members of the Here are some stories from the Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. The Magic Monastery A certain quiet dervish used often to attend the weekly meals given by a cultivated and generous man. The circle was known as the Assembly of the Cultured. The dervish never took part in the conversation but simply arrived smilingly shook hands with all present, seated himself in a corner, and ate the food provided. When the meeting was over, he would stand up, say a word of farewell and thanks, and go his way. Nobody knew anything about him, though when he first appeared, there were rumours that he was a saint. For a long time, the other guests thought that he must indeed be a man of sanctity and knowledge, and they looked forward to the time when he might impart some of his wisdom to them. Some of them even boasted of his attendance at their meetings to their friends, hinting at the special distinction which they felt at his presence. Gradually, however, because they could feel no relationship with this man developing, the guests began to suspect that he was an imitator, perhaps even a fraud, Several of them felt uncomfortable in his presence. He seemed to do nothing to harmonize himself with the atmosphere and did not even contribute a proverb to the enlightened conversation which they had come to prize as a necessary part of their very lives. A few, on the other hand, became unaware that he was there at all since he drew no attention to himself. But one day the dervish spoke. He said... I invite all of you to visit my monastery tomorrow night. You shall eat with me. This unexpected invitation caused a change of opinions in the whole assembly. Some thought that the dervish, who was very poorly dressed, must be mad and surely could provide them with nothing. Others considered his past behaviour to have been a test. At last, they said to themselves, at last he would reward them for their patience in bearing with such dreary company. Still others said to one another, Beware, for he may well be trying to lure us into his power. But curiosity led them all, including their host, to accept the hospitality. The following evening, the dervish led them from the house to a hidden monastery of such size and magnificence that they were dazed. The building was full of disciples carrying out every kind of exercise and task. The guests passed through contemplation halls filled with distinguished-looking sages who rose in respect and bowed at the dervish's approach. The feast which they were given surpassed all powers of description. The visitors were overwhelmed. 
all begged him to enroll them as disciples forthwith. But the dervish would only say to all their entreaties, wait until morning. Morning came, and the guests, instead of waking in the luxurious silken beds to which they had been conducted the night before, clad in gorgeous robes, found themselves lying stiff and stark, dispersed on the ground within the stony confines of a huge and ugly ruin on a barren mountainside. There was no sign of the dervish, of the beautiful arabesques, the libraries, the fountains, the carpets. The infamous wretch, he's tricked us with the deceits of sorcery, shouted the guests. They alternately condoled with and congratulated one another for their sufferings and for having at last seen through the villain, whose enchantments obviously wore off before he could achieve their evil purpose, whatever that might have been. Many of them attributed their escape to their own purity of mind. But what they did not know was that by the same means which he had used to conjure up the experience of the monastery, the dervish had made them believe that they were abandoned in a ruin. They were, in fact, in neither place. He now approached the company as if from nowhere and said, We shall return to the monastery. He waved his hands and all found themselves back in the palatial halls. Now they repented for they immediately convinced themselves that the ruins had been the test and that this monastery was the true reality. Some muttered, It is as well that he did not hear our criticisms. Even if he only teaches us this strange art, it will have been worthwhile. But the dervish waved his hands again, and they found themselves at the table of the communal meal, which they had, in fact, never left. The dervish was sitting in his customary corner, eating his spiced rice as usual, saying nothing at all. And then, watching him uneasily, all heard his voice speak, as if within their own breasts, though his lips did not move. He said, While your greed makes it impossible for you to tell self-deceit from reality, there is nothing real which a dervish can show you, only deceit. Those whose food is self-deceit and imagination can be fed only with deception and imagination. Everyone present on that occasion continued to frequent the table of the generous man, but the dervish never spoke to them again. And after some time, the members of the assembly of the cultured realized that his corner was now always empty. The Onion There was once a time in a country in which onions were rare, in fact almost unknown. Someone left a large onion standing in the public square of the principal town of that land. The citizens, or many of them, were interested in this curious object. They could see that it was some kind of vegetable. The first person to venture near it coughed by chance as he approached. He immediately went away to teach that onions make you cough. The second found it had a strong smell. Although he wanted to take some of it, he said to himself, If the outside is as strong as this, then the inside must indeed be impossible to bear. So he left it alone. The third man made a cut in the onion. One layer came off in his hand. Miraculous object, he said to all and sundry. This has magical qualities. You cut it, and it discards the whole of its outside, leaving an inside which is just the same. The fourth man stripped off another layer. He took it away, cooked and ate it, and he found it delicious. Then he taught others to do the same. However many layers you bear away, this amazing vegetable always presents you with another. This is a kind of perpetual harvest, they exclaimed. Someone remarked, it seems to be getting smaller. That is a sheer optical illusion, said the others, because they wanted to believe that the onion was everlasting. And when the last jacket had been ripped from the onion, 
everyone exclaimed. Undoubtedly a magical, but yet a treacherous thing, this. It can not only disappear, but does so without any warning at all. They all agreed, as indeed was the most sensible thing to do, that people were better off on balance without onions. The Botanists Land Without Medicine Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a garden tended by loving and talented workers. The garden was developed through effort and sacrifice from waste land and at a time when nobody in the whole world cared about gardens. The botanists and other specialists who worked here over a vast expanse of time sent out expeditions to find and bring back every kind of plant from the most remote places imaginable. Some of the plants, like cotton, yielded fibres suitable for spinning. Others provided nutritious food. Other plants, again, had medicinal virtues. But then a calamity struck the garden, so that most of the gardeners were killed. The remainder of them were compelled to withdraw to distant places. In due course, other people arrived. They soon recognized the practical value of food plants, and they cultivated them. Then they discovered that some of the flowers and herbs could be used as dyes. Finally, for they were indefatigable experimenters, they penetrated the secrets of the textiles, which could be made from fibrous material. And yet, strangely, these people failed to discover the special properties of the medicinal plants, and so they had no real medical science at all. When they became ill, they spoke incantations, and they either recovered, or were maimed, or died. This they regarded as the right and natural order of events. Some legends about medicine reached them from time to time, but they were irrational people and did not believe in this cult, since it sounded like a superstition or wishful thinking, as it would to you if you had been brought up without it. They said, of course, everyone wants to become better, so people have fantasized the science of medicine. The botanists, however, still existed. Some of them came back to the place which had formerly been their garden, planted by their own ancestors. It was then that they discovered, to their dismay, that medicine was now regarded locally as archaic nonsense. We should soon be able to put people right on this, they said, for we can demonstrate that illnesses can be cured in many cases by simple means, through an expert knowledge of plants. They were, to be sure, not only botanists, but also people of caution. Before attempting to restore the knowledge of leechcraft, they carried out a survey of the nature and behavior, the thoughts and the institutions of the people who now lived in the garden. It was then that they received a shock. The people who had superseded them were apart from a minority generally totally unsuited for the study of medicine, overlaid with such habits of selective reasoning that even demonstration would not convince them that there could be such a thing as medicine. True, they clamoured for demonstration, but then they would not allow the scientists, the anachronists as they called them, to demonstrate medicine in a manner which would allow a cure to take place. For instance, they insisted upon their own conditions, such as that all cures should take place within six minutes, or that nothing should be taken internally as a medicine in case it harmed someone. So the scientists went into seclusion again, until the people should become so desperate and so riddled with disease that they would submit to the superstitious treatments which they otherwise shunned or until there were enough dispassionate students among those who reckoned that medicine was a possibility for real demonstrations to be held. At the Crossroads 
A Sufi was sitting at a crossroads one morning when a young man came up to him and asked whether he could study with him. Yes, for one day, said the Sufi. Throughout the day, one traveller after another stopped to ask questions about man and life, about Sufism and Sufis, or to beg for help, or just to pay respects. But the Sufi wanderer merely sat in an attitude of contemplation, his head on his knee, and he made no answer at all. One by one, the people went away. Towards evening, a poor man with a heavy bundle approached the pair and asked the way to the nearest town. The Sufi immediately stood up, took the man's burden on his own shoulders, and conducted him a part of the way along the right road. Then he returned to the crossroads. The young disciple asked, Was that man, miserable peasant though he looked, really a, a saint in disguise, one of the secret wanderers of high rank? The Sufi sighed and said, No, but he was the only person whom we have seen today who really sought the object which he claimed to want. Fantasy. The professor said, Gentlemen, among the most rewarding sides of psychoanthropology is the analysis of myths and legends of primitive peoples. Such a study casts brilliant light upon the incapacities of undeveloped man, as well as upon his compensation mechanism, how he invents marvels, magical substitutes for the fulfillments which he has never experienced. As an example, consider the ancient legend met in many different communities of the camera. This instrument was supposed to be able to capture in frozen form events which were visible to the spectator and to reproduce them or a similitude of them at will. I need hardly say that the entire conception of such an apparatus springs only from the very human desire to preserve moments of excitement and pleasure. Then there is the fable about the production of an energy of a special kind in some languages called electricity. This has truly wonderful wish fulfillment properties. Why, by connecting to a supply of electricity different kinds of apparatus, man was reputed to have been able to cause heat or cold, to kill or to stimulate, to transmit the human voice for incalculable distances. There are, I regret to say, even today, sadly misled people who imagine that these legends contain what they like to call a germ of truth. Some of them have even gone so far as to postulate reasons why they are likely to be true. But the explanations are always too bizarre. The wishful thinkers have to invent a myth, or at the least graft one myth onto another. An instance is the answer of the cranks to the question, why are there no cameras or electrical contrivances now? The answer is, of all amazing rationalizations, because at a certain time all the metal in the world was atomized, so we can't make them now. You observe that in order to sustain the fantasy, it has been necessary to invent a wondrous substance known in the legends of some tribes as metal. Zaki and the Dove There was once a man named Zaki. Because of his capacities and his promise, a certain teacher, the Khaja, decided to help him. This Khaja assigned a subtle creature of special powers to attend upon Zaki and to help him whenever he could. As the years passed, Zaki found that his material and other affairs prospered. He did not imagine that such advantages as he was receiving were entirely due to himself, and he started to notice a coincidence of events. Whenever his affairs were about to go well, he observed a small white dove was to be seen somewhere nearby. The fact was that the subtle attendant, in spite of his powers, 
needed to be within a certain distance of Zaki to carry on his work. In spite of his remarkable abilities, in his transition into the present dimension, he had to take a form. A dove was the form which he had adopted as most suitable. But Zaki only connected doves with luck, and luck with doves. So he started to keep doves, and to put down food for any doves which he saw, and to have doves embroidered on his clothes. He became so interested in doves that everyone in the world thought him an authority on them. But his material and other affairs ceased to prosper, because his concentration had been diverted from intention to manifestation, and the subtle attendant in the form of a dove himself had to withdraw to avoid becoming a cause of Zaki's undermining of himself. The Tristomachic Survival Once upon a time there were three kinds of people on a certain planet. There were those with one stomach, those with two, and those with three stomachs. At first nobody realized that there was any difference between them. They lived in different areas and adopted the food and habits which corresponded best with their stomachic peculiarities. But as they multiplied, their differences became matters of contention. Sometimes the monostomachics prevailed, sometimes the bistomachics, sometimes the tristomachics. Then, with realism and through a desire for equity, they decided to abolish all differences based on stomachs. The result was that people, happily enough, eventually forgot that there were any of these anatomical differences. They now had a unified culture, which was completely blind to this detail. Even the technological instruments devised by the people did not register stomach differences. And then a new element crept in. As food supplies increased in quantity and decreased in quality, for unforeseen reasons, the monostomachics and bistomachics could not endure the new diet and began to die out. Because the ancient taboo against knowing anything about stomachs had been established even in the genetic inheritance of the people, nobody could solve the problem, and only the tristomachics survived. Literature Ibn Yusuf said, so many people used to come to see me with books that they had read and wanted interpreted, or books that they had written and wanted opinions about, or books of other sorts, that I was at my wit's end. I went to see a doctor who was also a sage. I said, give me some remedy for this problem. He gave me yet another book. This one was to show to the book readers. Inside, it contained only one phrase, and this is it. Time wasted reading this sentence could be employed more profitably in almost any other manner. Pitcher Law Have you heard about the tragedy of the little pitcher? He heard a thirsty man calling for water from his sickbed in a corner of a room. The pitcher was so full of compassion for the man that by a supreme effort of will he actually managed to roll to within an inch of the sufferer's hand. When the man opened his eyes and saw a pitcher beside him, he was full of wonderment and relief. He managed to pick up the jug and held it to his lips. Then he realized that it was empty. With almost the last remains of his strength, the invalid threw the pitcher against a wall where it smashed into useless pieces of clay. Prisoner. A man was once sent to prison for life for something which he had not done. When he had behaved in an exemplary way for some months, his jailers began to regard him as a model prisoner. He was allowed to make his cell a little more comfortable, and his wife sent him a prayer carpet, which she herself had woven. When several more months had passed, 
This man said to his guards, I am a metal worker, and you are badly paid. If you can get me a few tools and some pieces of tin, I will make small decorative objects, which you can take to the market and sell. We could split the proceeds to the advantage of both parties. The guards agreed, and presently the smith was producing finely wrought objects whose sale added to everyone's well-being. Then, one day, when the jailers went to the cell, the man had gone. They concluded that he must have been a magician. After many years, when the error of the sentence had been discovered, and the man was pardoned and out of hiding, the king of that country called him and asked him how he had escaped. The tinsmith said, Real escape is possible only with the correct concurrence of factors. My wife found the locksmith who had made the lock on the door of my cell and other locks throughout the prison. She embroidered the interior designs of the locks in the rug which she sent me on the spot where the head is prostrated in prayer. She relied upon me to register this design and to realize that it was the wards of the locks. It was necessary for me to get materials with which to make the keys and to be able to hammer and work metal in my cell. I had to enlist the greed and need of the guards so that there would be no suspicion. That is the story of my escape. The Mirror, the Cup and the Goldsmith A certain goldsmith worked for many years to perfect a magic mirror and a cup. The chief properties of these articles were that the mirror showed which one of one's friends was in any trouble and the cup enabled the user to dissolve troubles by dropping a pebble into it. It could also make one rich. The goldsmith, however, was unable to use the magical mirror and cup because they could be operated only by a certain kind of man. Desiring to make his discoveries available to whoever could use them, the goldsmith journeyed far and wide, seeking a recipient for the magic treasures. At last, he found an engraver of Bukhara with the necessary characteristics. He gave the objects to him, saying, Make good use of these. I shall return one day to see if they have brought you fortune. The first time the engraver looked into the mirror, he saw the goldsmith struggling in a whirlpool about to drown. He threw a pebble into the magic cup and soon saw that the goldsmith was saved. The second time he looked into the mirror, the goldsmith was seen to be surrounded by dangerous and concealed enemies. By the use of the cup, the engraver was able to dispel them. The third time that he looked into the mirror, he saw that all the goldsmith's friends, associates and family were in all manner of difficulties. Again, by the use of the cup, the engraver was able to effect their rescue. When he looked into the mirror again, the engraver saw that he was himself threatened by difficulties. So he threw a pebble into the cup and his problems vanished. Many months later, when the goldsmith returned, he found his mirror and cup gathering dust on the engraver's bench and the engraver still working away at the fine work which was ruining his eyesight. He was incensed. I have been to so much trouble making these magical objects. Then I had to find a fitting recipient for them, he fumed. And yet you neglect them and put them aside as if they were nothing. You do not even use them to succor your friends. And why have you not made yourself rich? The engraver said nothing. For how could one reason with a man who, rare skills or not, jumped at conclusions without thought or due inquiry? He picked up the magical cup and a pebble which lay beside it. By this time, the goldsmith had become so enraged that he was waving his arms threateningly and calling the engraver all kinds of names. Fumbling a little with the objects because of his poor eyesight, 
the engraver allowed the pebble to fall into the cup. The guardian of the cup, seeing the goldsmith in a threatening posture, made him disappear, and he has never been seen since. The Oatland Story. There was once a man who adopted oatmeal as the be-all and end-all of life. His reason for making this decision is not questioned by his numerous followers because they came to hold this wisdom to be self-evident. Critics, who are sure to be biased, of course, have disputed whether it was because his name happened to be Avena, Latin for oat, or whether he merely became obsessed by some form of self-flattery based on his sense of the fitness of things. He certainly liked oats, if we are to believe the ancient chronicles. To him, they were beautiful, tasty, nutritious and versatile. He rapidly convinced many people of these and other advantages. He was, of course, marked by his idealism, logicality and dedication to the cause and exemplary life. Even porridge, as he was easily able to demonstrate, gave scope for practical as well as theoretical applications and extension and inventions and even lyricism. He and his early associates cultivated oats, sniffed them powdered, and applied them in various ways to the skin. Oats were soon found useful for such diverse things as glue, bricks, modelling, making paper, feeding rats, and purposes of religious observance. Baked, sawed, and coloured, treated in a thousand different ways, generations of tireless and heroic experimenters found the substance a means for the liberation of man and the enrichment of his life. The diversity of Otis applications itself stimulated people to ever greater achievements. Who could doubt the value and then inevitably the indispensability of such a discovery? All civilization could be seen as built upon oats. The analogies, symbolism and other more refined relationships of oats also played a full part in human culture. Even before many of these developments had taken place, the birth of Oatland was a foregone conclusion. Because of this unique flowering of the Oatish genius, it was at first called the Land of Oats. When, quite logically, the word oat itself came to denote perfection, the country accepted the title of the Oat of Lands. Oatism became a valued and self-perpetuating system because its results were proved by its assumptions and its assumptions were proved by its results. A certain form of education was characteristic of Oatland. Naturally, it was the only form. Who would have built schools if it had not been necessary to pass on oatishness? How could the civilization have developed without oats and without institutions which taught oatistically so that the younger generation could benefit from the heritage of oatism for which so many had suffered and to build up which so many had labored for so long? If schools had not been devised, man would certainly have remained sunk in ignorance and depravity. It was inconceivable that any alternative would have developed. What alternative could there have been since we all know that man needs oats, lives oats, thinks oats, are oats not his dearest possession and guarantee of his sovereignty of thought? Does man's stomach not reject any other intrusion? An Oatland Defence Council publication, Digestion, had this to say. It has been suggested by would-be dissentients from oatism that man could, in fact, digest some other food than oats. The reasoning behind this speculation is remarkably ingenious, it is held that man can digest only oats because he has eaten them for so long that this has become a limitation. The dangerous nature of this corollary to this absurdity is that man could try to wean himself from oats or else to eat little by little other things as well as oats. It is self-evident, however, that only the gullible and esotericist unbalance would be interested in such an attempt. The risk, too, is that the result in certain starvation would cause early death. 
Occasional troublemakers and those who dared, it is true, said to Oatlanders, why not eat fruit? But they were soon told with rapier-sharp logic, fruit is repugnant to any free-born Oatlander. Unthinking morons, too, were heard to say, why not build with clay bricks? When they got any reply at all, which was more than they deserved, it soon put them in their place. Clay is for moles. Besides, Avena the First, our glorious founder, would have ordained and guided the use of clay if it had been of any use. When it other adventurers said, metal can be used to make tools, they were told, a tool of porridge is a real tool. A porridge metal would be a real metal. But autistic capacity was not limited to defending the porridge or tirelessly researching into its values and uses. The philosophy could challenge all comers with an unanswerable dialectic. If any of these crazy ideas outside autism were capable of being useful in life, they could be explained in Oaklandese, the richest, most sublime medium of communication devised by man. On one occasion, an Otis theoretician said, you non otis are a mere rabble of mystics, esotericists, magicians, occultists, shamans, madmen, frustrated spinsters, gullible idiots, obsessionals, and hopeless cases. No, we're not, said the non otis But the thing to realise is that they mostly were. And they were, ironically, because they had been driven that way by Otists. Real non otis as distinct from sensationalists, were compelled to organise themselves in a tight and discreet manner for protection from the wilder Otists, and the Oakland disaffected, who clamoured for admission, claiming the name of unotism and making more noise than anyone else. The Oaklanders only had to point to this rabble, who couldn't even grow oats, virtually to prove that all non-otis were deranged. Meanwhile, of course, otism was producing a rich and promising culture. Some idea of its extent and inspirational value may be gleaned from even small quotations from its hoary wisdom. When facts were short, or time-limited, Inspiration could come into its own with such uplifting rallying cries as 90 million Oaklanders can't be wrong. Nobody could accuse Oaklanders of being narrow-minded. Intense interest was aroused by genuinely new thoughts. One of the Otian philosophers demonstrated the continuing fecundity of the race by saying, I am a porridge man, therefore I exist. There was the occasional tyrant who said, Porridge? It is I. But such people died sooner or later leaving the beauty and validity of the thing unchallenged. Oakland Forever is one of the most touching of the traditional airs. Its opening words are graceful oat, holy oat, loving oat, giving oat, 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 oat. There were also revolutions in thought from time to time when the old sentimentalities were severely criticised. One such was when modernist writers explored the possibilities of new ways to express their inner being. The first few stanzas of a typical example of the new poetry show how the vitality of the human spirit has been maintained. Oat, Ota, Aot, Tao. The self-renewing sensation engendered by throwing off the shackles of hide brown traditionalism in this manner must surely be unique. Oaklandism, to be sure, employed arguments derived by sophistry in selection from its basic documents to support its beliefs. If anyone else adduced other documents, they were quite fitly characterised as regressive and unreliable. Fresh interpretations of the Oatland documents were accepted, or otherwise, according to whether the methods used were otiferous or not. Before dissentients were finally laughed into silence, some were reputed to have said, Don't abandon oats, but add other things to your life. You can do it. The reaction was that they were malcontents or lying, trying to unsettle people. Although society was continuously developing, some people always had an admiration for the old ways. Flowers used to be left on the statue of Avena the First, and of the Otis martyr who said, Take my body and soul, you will never get my oats. The conservative element in this model open society, where all forms of opinion were allowed free expression, said, If there were any alternative to oats, People would not have used them for 50,000 years, would they? The progressives who disagreed said, There is a simple though different alternative. It is porridge. The liberal element hoped for a compromise based on baked oat cakes as a way of life. These are a few sayings preserved by this high culture as worthy of its great sons and daughters. 
If your oats are warm, use them as a plaster. If not, heat them. Oats rhymes with goats, but otherwise the two are poles apart. All that's sticky is not oats. An oat a day keeps cornmeal away. What, if anything, eventually happened to the Oatlanders? I'm afraid I don't know. Some people say they died out. It seems more likely that such a calumny arose in the minds of their envious detractors. The Fool. There was once a man who did one thing right and one thing wrong in that order. The first thing was to tell a fool that he was a fool. The second thing was not to have made sure that he was not standing beside a deep well. The Boy and the Wolf. I dreamt that I was having a conversation with a wolf. I said, You wolves are famous among us humans, and we have a lot of stories about you. The wolf said, How interesting. What kind of stories? So I told him the fable of the boy who cried wolf. That's funny, said the wolf. We haven't got that story. But there is one with the same two main characters. It is called The Wolf Who Cried Boy. But you must have heard of it. I'm afraid I haven't, I said. And so the wolf told it. Once upon a time, there was a wolf. He got to know a boy who was also a wolf hunter. As soon as he realized the danger of a human who was a hunter, the wolf ran from one pack of his brethren to another, shouting, Boy! Boy! But, since the wolves had no idea what a boy was, and had little conception of wolf hunters, they took no notice at all. And some of us say that it is because wolves are so silly on the whole that people, even boys sometimes, can hunt them. But surely, I said, if you have a fable like that, it will serve to warn all wolves that there are such dangers and make them more careful. I can see, said the wolf, that some of you humans are not much more intelligent than the run-of-the-mill wolf. Like us, you seem to imagine that tales will warn and instruct. But you don't notice that the instruction comes more often than not through recognition after the event, rather than before it. Besides, wolves, I don't know about people, always consider that fables really refer to others, not to themselves. It was this awful thought which woke me up. But fortunately, the wolf had vanished. City of Storms. Once upon a time, there was a city. It was very much like any other city, except that it was almost permanently enveloped in storms. The people who lived in it loved their city. They had, of course, adjusted to its climate. Living amid storms meant that they did not notice thunder, lightning and rain most of the time. If anyone pointed out the climate, they thought that he was being rude or boring. After all, having storms was what life was like, wasn't it? Life went on like this for many centuries. This would have been all very well, but for one thing. The people had not made a complete adaptation to a storm climate. The result was that they were afraid, unsettled, and frequently agitated. Since they had never seen any other kind of place in living memory, cities or countries without storms belonged to folklore or the babblings of lunatics. There were two tried recipes which caused them to forget for a time their tensions, to make changes and to obsess themselves with what they had. At any given moment in their history, some sections of the population would have their attention fixed on change and others on possessions of some kind. The unhappy ones would only then be those who were doing neither.
rain poured down, but nobody did anything about it because it was not a recognised problem. Wetness was a problem, but nobody connected it with rain. Lightning started fires, which were a problem, but these were regarded as individual events without a consistent cause. You may think it remarkable that so many people knew so little for so long. But then we tend to forget that compared to present day information, most people in history have known almost nothing about anything. And even contemporary knowledge is daily being modified and even proved wrong. The Right Man A general, riding across country, became separated from his staff and eventually arrived at a small village, completely lost. The villagers gathered around him and he started to give them orders. He asked them to feed his horse, but they did not react at all. He called for a stable, for water, for blankets, and nobody moved. If you do not obey me instantly, shouted the general, I shall act against you with the utmost rigour. The chief of the village said, You don't look very strong to me. How would you do anything to us? How could you? It is not a matter of my doing anything, shouted the infuriated general. It is a matter of the chain of command. And what is the chain of command? Well, I tell the colonel, and he tells the major, and he tells the captain, and he tells the lieutenant, and he tells the sergeant, who brings a squad of men. They stand you up against a wall and shoot you, puff, like that. Now you are getting somewhere, said the chief of the village. This sergeant, he really must be a powerful man. So far we've only seen you. But if we had the sergeant to deal with from the beginning, that would have been something. Vanity. A Sufi sage once asked his disciples to tell him what their vanities had been before they began to study with him. The first said, I imagined that I was the most handsome man in the world. The second said, I believe that since I was religious, I was one of the elect. The third said, I believed I could teach. And the fourth said, My vanity was greater than all these, for I believed that I could learn. The sage remarked, and the fourth disciple's vanity remains the greatest, for his vanity is to show that he once had the greatest vanity. Greed, Obligement and Impossibility A Sufi said, None can understand man until he realises the connection between greed, obligement and impossibility. This, said his disciple, is a conundrum which I cannot understand. The Sufi said, Never look for understanding through conundrums when you can attain it through experience. He took the disciple to a shop in the nearby market where robes were sold. Show me your very best robe, said the Sufi to the shopkeeper, for I am in a mood to spend excessively. A most beautiful garment was produced and an extremely high price was asked for it. It is very much the kind of thing I would like, said the Sufi, but I would like some sequins around the collar and a touch of fur trimming. Nothing easier, said the seller of robes, for I have just such a garment in the workroom of my shop. He disappeared for a few moments and then returned, having added the fur and sequins to the self-same garment. And how much is this one? asked the Sufi. Twenty times the price of the first one, said the shopkeeper. Excellent, said the Sufi. I shall take both of them. The Man and the Snail A man once saw a snail sitting in a crevice in a wall. He called out, Hello, snail. Believe it or not, that snail could speak and it could hear, and it said, 
Hello there, what are you doing? The man said, I am a human being. Are you like us? asked the snail. In a way, but there are a lot of things which we can do that you cannot. Name them. Well, for instance, you have eyes on stalks. We have stalks on the other end, called legs. We have feet on them. By moving the legs and feet, we can cover vast distances in no time at all. That sounds quite extraordinary. Anything else? Well, we have no shell. We don't need one. No shell? Huh. I suppose it's possible. Anything else? And we can communicate without words, without even being together. Our method is to take something like, say, a leaf, make a mark on it called writing, and send it by another human being. Now, by what is called reading, the person who receives it can know what the writer was thinking. The snail said, The trouble with you, as with all liars, is that you go too far. I have trapped you into overreaching yourself by pretending to believe you. But if I further encourage you by not expressing the disbelief natural to all rational beings, I shall be a partner in your sinful lies. Vine Thought Once there was a vine, which realized that people came every year and took its grapes. It observed that nobody ever showed any gratitude. One day, a wise man came along and sat down nearby. This, thought the vine, is my opportunity to have the mystery solved. It said, Wise man, as you may have observed, I am a vine. Whenever my fruit is ripe, people come and take the grapes away. None shows any sign of gratitude. Can you explain this conduct to me? The wise man thought for a time. Then he said, The reason, in all probability, is that all those people are under the impression that you cannot help producing grapes. What to shun? Two worthy citizens of the land of fools were talking together. Do you know, said the first, that whenever I read the multiplication tables, my head starts to swim. But this is amazing, shouted the second, because the very same thing happens to me when I run any distance. Unable to see any common explanation for the two happenings, they took their experiences to the very wisest man of the land. The very wisest man said, it is obvious that both numbers and running were invented by an undesirable person and his influence still subsists in them, therefore shun both. The Man A Bektashi dervish approached a certain bishop and said, I have heard of a young man who harangues crowds, advocating their breaking the law, claims supernatural connections, performs miracles, and contradicts himself. Enough, said the bishop. He shall be tried, charged with blasphemy and upsetting public order. If he does not recant, he may be put to death as a heretic and corrupter. Just tell me his name, and I shall arrange the rest. I wish you could realize how impressed I am by your competence, said the Bektashi. His name is Jesus. The wand. In some cultures, miracles are effected in legend by waving fairies' wands. In others, there is the spirit of the magic ring. The objects do vary. Sometimes they are swords, for instance, sometimes cups. They originate from strange supernatural creatures, variously named. People have always been curious about these objects and have indeed sought them far and wide. 
But why is it so difficult to find them? Why can one not seem to be able to make contact with the creatures who make or operate these wonders? I shall tell you. You may even believe me. Once upon a time, when this kind of story was first used, the sages who told them used to say clearly what the objects were and who the creatures were. But this information so conflicted with all human beings' imaginings about magical objects and powerful creatures and so affronted them that they turned upon the tellers and many were killed. Since then, the identity of the creatures and the real nature of the objects has always been concealed well enough to prevent easy interpretation and to cause the more destructive people to sneer at the whole idea as primitive, ridiculous, spurious. If you want your food to be safe from the greedy, tell them that it is poisonous. Better still, let them suppose that they are clever enough to discover that it is harmful or useless to them. <laughs>